Good evening. Rex likes this with text. <laughs> I had to have it turned up for Mark this morning. <laughs> oh, I see. In the way of the bulletin, we're going to be singing God Will Make a Way, page 704. Let's sing it twice. It's a short one. Let's all stand and sing. Anybody have a praise item? We spend all the time you want to do praise God. Okay? Testify to His goodness. What about you? We'll start with you, Sister Carol. Okay, well, yesterday I had my old favorite, Brother Greg Dollar, Everett, and Brother Beyonce. And Brother Greg Dollar was the
We had a good Sunday school class this morning. Had no preachers in there. <laughs> and well, I did have did have one. Had Ron Hanna, but uh, no, it went real well this morning. Good. I'm glad you started that class back up. And uh, we're blessed. said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Anybody else, Richard? Do you know anybody else? been teaching you something lately, something you want to share, and thank God for, or ask for more prayer. That's what we do here when we meet together, isn't it? What we should be doing. Um, anything on your mind and heart you share with your brothers and sisters? God's design for us as powerfully and as intimately as we can. That's God's plan. Jesus uh, prayed a prayer. He prayed many prayers. What was a, a uh, what was a prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. another prayer on the cross. Think about it. I know you'll come up with it. Sister Kate. 
eight, as long as I can learn to rinse out dry first. <laughs> Sense he did, yes. Today you will be with me in paradise. He cried out to God, and what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. John chapter 1, let's just go by memory for a moment while folks are opening to Psalm 22. John chapter 1. Fill in for me. In the beginning was the word, word and word was with God, and word was God. Was God. Go on over to 14 verse. And the word. word became flesh and blood among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the living word, always has been the word, the expression, the truth-telling one of the Trinity. He told the truth of the Father God, the invisible God. No man has seen God at any time, but the Son has seen him because the Son is God. And he came to tell who the Father was, what the Father was like, and he did it successfully, and not only successfully, but Jesus did it, what's another word? Perfectly. Did it. He is the word of God. Jesus knew the word. And in Psalm 22, this was a thousand years before Jesus was born as a human. And in Psalm 22, we read, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But, why have you forsaken me? That's sort of what he's saying, isn't it? Why have you forsaken me? So this was written a thousand years before Jesus took on flesh and became the worry in flesh. Um, but on the cross, Matthew 27, let's look at that. Matthew 27. If you can find it. And verse 46. Matthew 27. <clears throat> verse 46. And have you found it there, Blake? <laughs> Chapter 27. I'm glad as you look at it in that darkness. Small print that I wouldn't be able to find. It. Found it? Chapter 27 and verse 46. How about reading it for us? He's on the cross. Me. So Jesus is on the cross and he says something to the Father in a prayer asking the question, why have you forsaken me? Did he accidentally use those same words? No. He, he knew the words of the song. Of course, Jesus is the word of God. He's the eternal word of God. He knew, of course, Psalm 22. He knew it as God. He knew it as the author. 
as a subject. On top of that, which you won't compare, but on top of that, as a human being, a little boy, he heard that read in Psalm. He learned that that was a, a psalm crying out to God. And maybe there were some folks teaching him that that was predicting what Messiah would say. I don't know or not. But he figured that out, of course. He knew that that would be his prayer. Now, probably, right here in this chapter, if you just look up the historical timing of this chapter 22, this Psalm 22, you'll come up and you'll find that this was relating to David or other things about Israel. And it was a genuine prayer that David prayed. My God, why did you forsake me? He looked around, and all these things were happening. But even at that, if that was true, and that probably was true, there was much more meaning to that verse because, if for no other reason, because Jesus later said there was more reason to it when he quoted it. And he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was immediately pulling from his memory and his perfect knowledge, pulling this question from Psalm 22 up to his present situation on the cross. That is a wonderful thing about the Old Testament, isn't it? The Old Testament has many things. And if Jesus himself, or Paul maybe, or others in the New Testament had not taught us the deeper, more fuller meaning that involved Jesus Christ himself, if they hadn't taught it to us, we might not have ever discovered it by just reading the Old Testament, right? But we know it was there and it had meaning because Jesus used it in that certain way. And so many other references in the New Testament are pulled up for us to see, oh, wow, yeah, God intended for that to apply to Jesus. So Jesus knew the purpose of what he was suffering when he was on the cross. Jesus knew, and, he, and everything that was in him was true, and everything that was in him was God, and God liked us. And everything in him was lined up perfectly with the eternal purpose of God himself. Amen? Amen. Everything in him was in alignment with truth, with himself, with his purpose of being glorified and redeeming mankind through Jesus himself. He knew that. And so in, in that sense, Jesus knew that we would be able to worship God in spirit and in truth because of what he was going through on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was providing for our redemption and our salvation, which affords us the privilege of being worshipers. God's purpose for salvation is that we become worshipers. God's purpose in sending his only son was that we would become worshipers and that our worshiping would attract other people to consider and look to God and become worshipers. And whenever we witness and we carry the gospel, we are worshiping God in our actions, in our heart, in our intentions, through our voice. We're worshiping God when we witness and we tell others about Jesus. When we pull out our checkbook or our wallet or whatever and we support missions, we support people going to do a work for God. We're worshiping God with what he's blessed us with. We're worshiping him in our giving. That's what taking up the offering is. It's part of worship. All the things we do here is worship. And Jesus, of course, knew that the purpose was worship. And so around the ninth hour, which would be what time of day? 3 p.m., Okay. Starting at 6 a.m., the day began, the idea. Uh, nine hours would be three o'clock. Uh, Jesus knew Psalm 22. <laughs> it's his word. He is the word. He knew all the meaning of it. Uh, and he knew. He knew it was all about him. On the cross, he was dying. He was suffering for our sins. He was dying in our place. He was experiencing putridness from our sins in his clean, holy life. 
he was experiencing what we gave him, what he took upon himself. Sinfulness, wickedness, filth. He was experiencing all of that so that you and I, in purity and righteousness and holiness and love, could know the Father and worship him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, um, why, why, why did Jesus quote here? Well, he quoted some other things from this chapter well, as well. At least three other parts. Um, let's look at, um, let's see, we looked at verses 1 and 2. Um, my God, verse 2, I cry in the daytime, you, you do not hear me, and in the night season, I have not silent. So he's crying there. Let's see, I found uh, in verse 7, let's look at that. In verse 7, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Isn't that sort of what they said? Yes. Jesus? Hey, if, he, if he's God's son, if God can save him, well, let him call on him now. Let's see what he can do. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and it was mentioned here in Psalm 22. Yeah, and uh, I think it's where Matthew 27, where we were looking earlier, uh, those who passed by him were wagging their heads at him, like pooching out their lips and so forth. Uh, also look at verse 16 in, in Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me, dogs, like, like vicious attacking dogs, have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That happened on the cross. Jesus knew that. He was very familiar with this psalm. And then in verse 18, Psalm 8, uh, 22, 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that's what they did for Jesus' garment. They cast lots for his garment. And so Jesus knew this Psalm 22. And Jesus, he knew it so much because it was actually a part of him. All of Psalm 22, in fact, all of the Old Testament, really, is about Jesus. It's, it's presenting Jesus. It's setting the need for Jesus and the provision for him. And it was, it was what Jesus was all about. He was all wrapped up in doing the will of the Father and living out all the promises and prophecies that had been given, which were in the Old Testament. Psalm 22 was just the way Jesus lived. That was just part of his operating procedure. He just knew that was it. And so it was natural that he would quote, uh, would quote uh, this chapter. So why in the world did he say, though? Why did he say, why have you forsaken me? I, I looked up some bread and found some answers and some observations that you've heard them before. Um, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus say, I'm forsaken? Why have you forsaken me? One of the best answers is this. He was truly forsaken. He was real. He was a real forsakenness. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God did forsake him. It was real. He bore our judgment. The idea that the judgment on our sins from the Father, the whole plan was that the penalty of that would, would fall upon Jesus' his son. Why have you forsaken me? I am really truly forsaken. And he was really truly forsaken because he really and truly took our place. Let me tell you that if you and I are not saved, if we aren't forgiven of our sins through the only way we can be, and that's through Jesus Christ, then we are truly forsaken. And there's no hope for us. There's no salvation. If, if it's not real. It was real. The judgment was being poured out on him instead of on us. The wrath of God fell on Jesus. Why have you forsaken me? You have forsaken me. Because it's real. And 
yet he knew that while he was being forsaken for us, it was going to end up providing for our salvation. And we would be able to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him, that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that loving? Oh, how I love Jesus. I grew up singing that song over and over and over again. Not really feeling an intense love. You ever done that? But when I really realize what that love means, I can't just sing the words without thinking about the reality of them. There's a lot of songs that we sing we'll just focus enough and think enough about the truth of them, we'll just have to stop singing sometimes, or we won't sing to the top of our lungs, uh, voices, or we'll just want to sing humbly because we can't hardly get the words out. We're so touched and so moved. You've been there? You've been to those different spots, haven't you? That's worship. That's worship. You were made to worship. You were saved to worship. Jesus died for our sins so that we could worship and know God. If being saved is so wonderful, then the one who saved us must be worshipped. So he was truly abandoned. Being abandoned means that he, um, he was damned for our sins. Now you, like me, you've grown up hearing that word damned used as cuss word. It dawned on me as a teenager trying to grow in the Lord and trying to learn about the Lord. It dawned on me that no wonder you don't say, God damn you. Right? Because you don't want God to damn anybody and you don't have a right to ask God to or tell God to do that either. That is more like blasphemy and insulting to God than it is just saying a bad word. You know, it really is. It's insulting to God. It's, it's raising yourself up to a place that you have no right to be. But Jesus was damned. He went through the damnation for our sins. And so he really, he really was forsaken by God. I don't know in every way how, but I'm so glad he was, aren't you? Oh, how I love Jesus. But a second reason, other than the fact that he really was forsaken, is that um, he wasn't asking a question as much as he was crying out for the experience he was having. Jesus didn't need to ask. He knew ahead of time why he was being forsaken. Jesus knew why God abandoned him. He, at that very moment, he knew. He had already agreed to come. He had already come and announced that he was going to be crucified. And he had already been now crucified, hanging on the cross. He knew why he was being forsaken. So, but when he said, my God, my God, why? That was basically more a way of expressing the disastrous situation he was entering into. He knew. It, it, it was his way of just um, surrendering to it all and expressing the horror of life. The horror of it. Jesus was crying out, expressing what it's like to truly be a man. Did you ever see Burning Hell? You ever see Burning Hell? That movie? Oh, come on. You're kidding. Left Behind. Left Behind? Okay. You saw the Burning Hell. We saw it. Down South Georgia, we saw it. Y'all weren't saved? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really am shocked. I'm sorry. I really am shocked. This is a movie. Uh, I, I, it was not a movie song, okay? It, it was a movie that was made by some Christian organization. Um, and they had depicted what hell was like burning. 
this was probably made around 1970. I'm guessing. That's sort of when it came out. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I mean, the, the movie is also is a very early, cheaply made compared to Hollywood movie. And they had the tires burning. You could tell that the tires burning. And it was smelling. Of course, you couldn't smell it on the movie. I know, but you, you know, um, and it was like it, like it, what it would be like if you were burning in hell. And I watched that movie. I tell you what, a lot of folks asked Jesus to save them after that movie, the burning in hell. I don't know if you could find that on the internet or something. Uh, but uh, you'd be interested just to look at it. I really am surprised. It, everybody, it went everywhere. They showed it everywhere uh, when I was a young man, anyway. Um, well, that, that's not one of the song titles I would run out to really <laughs> look at. <laughs> the burning hell, yeah. Um, but, you know, Hellfire and Brimstone, there it was, right there. Well, I'll just leave that for you to look at. Okay. Um, I just thought everybody in our age was seen it. Didn't you think everybody would have seen it? Oh, come on. Help me. <laughs> the Burning Hell. There you go. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Estes Perkle. He's in it. No, he presented it. See, hundreds of biblical wonders filmed in the Holy Land. Tortured lost souls burning forever. Oh, the Orman organization. Okay, there was a family named Orman that lived in Nashville, Tennessee. I fixed the connection with something else. Anyway, in, in the old me here. So I was a student at Bible College in 1973, four or five. Um, and the Ormans were in Nashville. They were Christians, and they were they had made this movie, The Burning Hill. And um, then they came up with one called The Land Where Jesus Walked. Now, there's another movie called that, but this was this was his. didn't make it that big. But he had people come from the Bible College I was attending to go and help me on the set, you know, letting Paul down the basket over the... So we went out to the big reservoir in Nashville and a big old wall, you know, and, and they had the basket. And we were supposed to come walking by looking at Paul you know, and all that. And then we stoned Stephen and, you know, and we heard Paul preaching that, and Jesus has risen from the dead. Some of us were sitting out there saying, oh, that was, I did a lot of that stuff. So they made a movie, and I got in it. I never saw it. I don't remember it to be. The Ormond, look them up, Ormond. They, they were filming that, and they lived in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, let me see if I can find my way back home. <laughs> um, Jesus knew what was happening, and he gave himself up, as the Bible tells us. So he was actually crying out, expressing the horrors of abandonment. But also, he was he was showing that he himself is the ultimate fulfillment of the abandonment and the penalty of sin. Um, he was not asking so much a question from God as he was expressing uh, the horror of it being a real part of himself, that he really was going through this. Um, let me read it from the English Standard Version. Uh, Psalm 22, uh, let me go ahead and look. Look at verse 22 and 24, and then I'll read it from the English Standard Version. Uh, Psalm 22 and verses 22 and 24. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So this is like Jesus talking because he said, why have you forsaken me? I will uh, declare... Your name. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all the offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. So, uh, let me read it in another translation and see if it makes any difference. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him. There's all. All, of your, all your offspring of Israel do this. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. But, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. 
Uh, in other words, this psalm ends in a note of triumph. Give praise to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. He has not ignored your pleas. He has not added any afflictions to you in your affliction. Uh, he hasn't hidden his face, but he's heard you. And so this psalm ends in a note of triumph here, that even though God had forsaken him, and all these other things had taken place, that he was going to praise him, and he's going to tell his brothers to praise God because of this. This is Jesus' attitude toward his suffering. His attitude toward his suffering. And do you know what Jesus did for you and me? What we're talking about. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Does it ever just overwhelm you? Just between you and God? Do you ever just get overwhelmed with that truth? And cry? Or shout glory hallelujah? Or tell God that you love you, Lord? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. He endured the cross. He knew the joy that was set before him. But he was in anguish. Uh, it's like Jesus said, I know I've got a promise. And God's not going to despise me in the end. He's going to take me back and there's victory in the fulfillment of this agony. Jesus was in agony. He asked the Father, there's another way, let's go. But he, but he said, not my will, but your will be done. And he went through it. It was a real cry of desolation. <clears throat> so um, he did it to express himself before the Lord. Um, and as, as I said already, he was quoting this psalm and thinking of this psalm, obviously, because this is what his life was all about. This was the prophecy that was made. This is why he came. Why did he leave the glories of heaven? Why did he do that? He did that so he would purchase our salvation. He did that knowing the agony, knowing the affliction, knowing the pain. And when we realize that, then we are to um, let his mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he was. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. He came to earth as lowly as you can come. And became a man to start with. And a lowly man. And he took it, taking the form of a bondservant. He did it for you. And coming in the likeness of men. He did it for you and me. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself even more. Humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death. Even the death on the cross. That was the prophecy. That was the plan. Jesus could face it and ask this question and give this expression of honor because he knew he was in the middle of the glorious plan. He knew where he was. He knew where he'd been. He knew where he was and what else. He knew where he was going for the joy that was set before him. And now, the next verse that I didn't read in Philippians, therefore God has also hath highly exalted him. That's where he is now. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of your whole life? Is he worthy of some kind of sacrifice if it comes? Is he worthy of you setting aside your preferences, my preferences? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of being honored and testified about and glorified? Then why don't we do it more? Why don't we do it more? Why don't we just say? I praise the Lord. I love him. I'm amazed that he died for me. Just say it. Just express it. Say, me too. Me too. If David's here, he'd say, me too. I would hope. He's worthy. He's worthy of us using what we have to put forth noise out of our mouth and through our lips. He's worthy of talking to him and talking about him and praising him and lifting up his name 
and telling of the greatness of the Lord. And we don't do that near enough. I don't. I thought we could. And I'll make a rhyme here. We should. This was according to plan. He knew the prophecy. He knew he would fulfill it. And he was crying out personally in agony. But he knew it was under the control of sovereignty. What a beautiful word. Sovereignty. Sovereignty's got you covered. Sovereignty has you covered. And me covered. And we can go through and endure. How in the world can people suffer like I hear about Christians suffering sometimes, you know? You read about them suffering, don't you? Wow. How in the world? Because... They know that their God is sovereign. And God gives grace according to the need. And it was fulfilled. So the worst moment in all of the world's history, when Jesus was on the cross, that worst moment, God was in control. His plan was moving. His plan was in action. That plan, I love it when a plan comes together. But there ain't no plan like this plan. There is no plan. Like God's plan. And God's plan works. Because he works. His plan. We can trust him. And so he was really forsaken. He was expressing the desolation of the moment. Not asking for an answer necessarily. And he was amazingly, amazingly fulfilling the scripture promise. Everything was going according to plan. And he was witnessing that this plan, in all its horror and shock, that this plan was perfect. That's our salvation. No wonder the world doesn't welcome that message of the gospel. And if it wasn't for God himself, with his own power, with his own mercy, with his own grace, with his own wisdom, with his own heart of love, if it wasn't for God taking his message, which is the gospel, and applying it to people's heart and drawing them to himself, none of us would have ever accepted it. But there's a powerful work going on. Do you think folks are still getting saved? Do you think folks will get saved? Oh, Lord, sure. It's still going on. And God is doing his work. We get to be a part of it. We get to share the gospel. And we get to pray. We get to pray. Don't forget when you pray for somebody sick, pray for their heart too. Their spiritual heart. When you pray for somebody going through a tough time, don't forget to pray for them to get better things happen to them. Pray for their heart. Pray for their seeing Jesus. Pray for their being introduced to Jesus. <clears throat> Psalm 22. Amazing that Jesus was the center of that chapter. And he expressed it while he was on the cross. There's no telling what else we're going to learn when we get to heaven. That Jesus knew and already knows and sees it certain ways. It's going to be a wonderful time, folks. It's going to be a glorious time when we all get to heaven. When the saved get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. Okay, let's stop. Be dismissed in prayer. Okay. Brother Richard, would you lose it? up the burning hell.